Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. Joining me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning Live webinar series. Today, no pun intended, taking a closer look at macro photography. I'd actually received a few queries from photographers asking for tips and insights related to macro photography, so I thought it would make a good topic for a webinar. And I see we've got some folks from all over the US, and in fact, I've noticed well, I saw Neil, welcome, thanks for joining us today, and then uh, Kerrigan from Western Australia. It's very early in the morning there, so uh, thanks for tuning in at this late or early hour, Germany, and uh, all over the place. So thank you for those of you who've tuned in, joined, who shared some comments, some nice words aside. I think it was Stephanie, was it, that has a uh, notebook full, yeah, Stephanie with a notebook full of some of the Ask Tim Gray emails. And so uh, thank you all for your support. I appreciate it. And we're going to take a look, of course, at macro photography. For those of you who maybe don't know me, I'm Tim Gray, as you may have gathered already. Perhaps that's part of the reason you're here, is to listen to me talk about macro photography. Many of you receive my daily Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, which is now going out, has been going out for over 21 years. Yes, the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter is old enough to have a beer here in America. And so it's been a while, lots of great questions. You know, funny enough, I actually thought when I first started the email newsletter that at some point I would run out of questions. Clearly, that was a foolish thing to think because the questions continue and hopefully you're enjoying the answers, those of you who have signed up for those. If you're not getting the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter, you can sign up at asktimgray.com. And before we dive into the topic at hand, I also want to give a shout out to Hunt's photo and video, especially Noah Buchanan. He was really helpful in helping me come up with some some cool gadgets that I'm going to share with you today. Some some items that you know I, I was familiar with in general, but maybe have found a, a new product that has proven very helpful. And so, uh, and a variety of uh, products I hadn't known about at all. Some of them I probably should have, but there are some really cool new items that I'll share with you that can be tremendously helpful in macro photography. And of course, Hunts, as a sponsor of today's presentation, is going to offer some great show specials. I'll share a link at the end of the session, and so you can find the details. Basically, the items that I'm going to be sharing today, you can get at a discounted price, thanks to Hunts Photo and Video, to Gary Farber over there, as well as Noah Buchanan. And if you've got questions or an item in particular you're looking for on the page that I'll link to, be sure to send Noah an email if there's something in particular you're after and he can work up a special deal for you or give you some guidance, recommendations, etc. So be sure to check that out and I'll share that link at the end of today's presentation. And I also want to mention I'll have a couple of online workshops coming up. If you enjoy the presentation today, you like the style of learning, you may enjoy coming into the virtual classroom with me to learn more about Lightroom Classic. I have a couple of topics coming up in January. I'll be talking about cleaning up your mess in Lightroom Classic. I'm not suggesting that all of you have a mess in your Lightroom Classic catalog because I know some of you don't use <laughs> Lightroom Classic, but I know many photographers have struggled a little bit with getting order to their Lightroom Classic catalog. So I have an online workshop with one-on-one -on -one help. You can learn all about the details of that as well as in February, Mastering photo optimization, working in the develop module primarily to really get your photos looking their best. You can learn about both of those at graylearning.com. But without further ado, let's get into macro photography, exploring some of the details of macro photography so that we can get to those show specials from Hunt's Photo and Video that you'll definitely want to check out, especially, I, I might say, if you're relatively new to macro photography. Some of those specials will help get you on the right path. So let's dive right in and talk about why macro. And this is, you know, a topic that comes up whenever I'm talking with photographers, especially when I'm out on a field photography workshop and maybe we're photographing grand landscapes or uh, street photography in New York City or, you know, whatever other workshops I've led. And sometimes the topic of close-up or macro photography comes up when I recommend getting a closer look at things. And sometimes I'm met with the notion of why? <laughs> why do I need to take a closer look? Why do I need to have a close focusing lens, for example? And I would say, in short, macro photography opens up just a whole new world of photography. One of the things that I think is really interesting photographically is when we can capture something 
that we can't really experience with normal human vision. A good example of that, I think, would be a long exposure. Our visual system has latency that causes uh, effectively what amounts to somewhere around a 30th of a second in terms of the shutter speed of our eyes, if you will, which means we can't experience in the real world with our normal vision a 30-second exposure, for example. And photography makes that possible. Or to freeze frame, to freeze very fast motion, that's something that we can't experience with normal vision. And so in many ways, I think photography can be more interesting when it's giving us a view into something that we can't see with our own eyes, essentially. And macro absolutely accomplishes that because we're getting such a close look. We're seeing some of the details in many cases that we might not have even known were there or that we certainly couldn't have appreciated in the same level of detail. And you know, with this photo, for example, it creates this almost kind of abstract scene. At first glance, you might not even know what these are. It's flower petals, of course. It doesn't take too long to figure that out. But the point is that initially it's sort of this otherworldly image and you might not immediately grasp what it is that you're looking for. It's just interesting shapes and textures and patterns. Obviously, in some cases, we don't have to go you know, all the way into the molecular level, as it were, in terms of getting a closer look. It can be simple rose petals with some, some dewdrops on them. We recognize relatively quickly what these are, but it's just a more interesting, in some respects, way of looking at what, in this case, is a familiar subject. So just getting a closer look, and I find, especially in macro, I like photos where, at first glance, you don't know what you're looking at. And it starts to kind of become more clear as you spend a few moments looking at the image. This, you know, at first glance almost looks like some sort of creatures waiting to be fed, uh, when in fact there are also some flower details. And, you know, when we've got something that captivates us, you know, a flower obviously can be beautiful. And when we have water droplets on a flower, that can just add a nice little element. But instead of making an overall scene with a flower be our photograph, we can take a much closer look and create something completely different, create something that gives us a, a unique way of interpreting a given subject. And again, a way of seeing a subject that we normally would not be able to experience without the benefit of a lens, essentially, a camera or you know, binoculars or a telescope or whatever the case might be. And in some cases, it really does become quite abstract. I would tell you exactly what this is a photograph of, but I don't remember the details. This was a while back in Austria, and I was doing a fair amount of macro photography, and it's some sort of plant, <laughs> some sort of uh, pollen fluff or what have you. I don't remember if it came from a tree or a, a flower or what it was from, but they struck me as interesting. And so getting a really, really close look where we're seeing these individual fibers, the tiny little seeds in here, and again, it creates this sort of abstraction. And, you know, again, it's not always something that is a mystery. This obviously is a leaf, but this almost takes on the look now with the veins and the details of almost a cityscape, you know, of satellite view of a city, perhaps, looking down at the various streets meandering through the neighborhoods. And so it really gives us this opportunity to create something unique in photography. And, you know, that is, by the way, one of the things that I often hear from photographers, especially going somewhere where you feel everybody else has already been there. You know, you go to Paris and you want to photograph the Eiffel Tower, but everybody has photographed the Eiffel Tower. And so how do you come up with something unique? And in macro, I would say that's in many respects a lot easier because you're getting such a unique look by taking a very, very close look at a subject. You're getting such a unique view into that subject that just by its nature, it's probably going to be relatively unique, all things considered. And it can be just so much fun to do that exploration to, you know, in my case, for example, over the last week or so, the weather has been not that great, a bit chilly, fair amount of rain, not exactly inspiring to go outside. But one of the great things with macro photography is that you can do macro photography with just about anything. And so just at home, exploring around the house, looking for things around that you might photograph, and there's certainly examples of that that I've run into where I just find some household object and think, you know, this could be interesting. In fact, I'll have a, a somewhat of an example of that in a moment. And just, you know, looking at nature in a different way. So getting a closer look at, you know, this little fly on a flower here. 
a, a closer look than we would normally get to an insect or this little beetle creature that was actually crawling on my finger and I thought it might be a fun little subject to take a picture of. Water droplets, I've given you know several examples of those, can always be very interesting. And again, that look at something here, we've got these striations of this blade of, I believe it's grass, and the water droplets, and the texture and detail, and it just, it almost becomes otherworldly. And so, you know, maybe this is more close-up versus macro. We'll talk about the distinction there shortly. But, you know, closer view of something, you know, a spider web with some nice water droplets in the morning dew and set against, in this case, some foliage and getting just an interesting pattern, you know, the light and shadow of these spheres of water. Or making, in this case, same basic subject in concept, but here almost at first glance seeming like a picture in outer space. You know, we've got this jet black background with the water droplets. And so again, just all sorts of different possibilities in terms of taking a closer look at a subject and coming away with some interesting photographs. And photographs that can really be quite captivating to the viewer. And another photo I'll share here, uh, <laughs> not one I'm proud of, mind you, but this was back when I was living in the Seattle area, and I happened to be an avid road cyclist. And so I'd gone out on a ride on a particularly wet and gritty, grimy day and looked down and saw the terrible state that my chain was in. Of course, the first thought is I really need to clean or maybe even in this case replace that chain. It's had a little bit too much exposure to the elements. But then I thought, you know, that actually might make for some interesting photography. And and more importantly, even if, you know, granted, I don't think anyone is going to want to buy a print of this image. If anybody's interested, just let me know. But I can't imagine anyone would want to hang an image like this up on their wall. Uh, I guess unless they were a, a bicycle mechanic and they wanted to put it up as an example of what not to let happen to your chain. But it's interesting in any event, uh, somewhat captivating. But to me, uh, the real fun here was literally fun. It was just so much fun to explore the links on the chain and finding, you know, which link was the most gritty and looked the worst in a manner of speaking so that I could come away with a photo that would be fun. So just all sorts of possibilities in macro photography. It can be such a tremendous amount of fun. And so if you've not taken advantage of macro photography, then certainly uh, I think it's something worth exploring. And I see actually, where did it go? I just saw somebody, ah, there we are. Uh, that it was a dandelion. And I, I, actually, that's probably true. Well, whoever posted the comment that that previous shot had been a dandelion probably knows what they're talking better than I do. And now that you mention it, it does have that look of those little seeds that'll float off with their the little the feathers, as it were, coming off. So macro can be tremendous fun. And there's all sorts of gear that can help you get into macro photography more easily, can make the task less frustrating, shall we say, and more fun. So you can focus on the fun side of it. But I do want to mention just briefly this distinction between macro and close-up photography. Uh, this photo, for example, I believe that's uh, some form of seed pod, and it would not qualify as macro. And there is sort of a technical definition of macro photography, and that generally is one-to-one -one or larger. What does one-to-one -one mean in the context of taking a picture of a subject? I think this is easiest to understand if we kind of go back in time a little bit to the days of film photography, specifically slide photography. So let's assume that we're going to photograph a picture of a penny, of a coin. So we, if it's a macro shot and it's one-to-one, -one, let's assume a perfectly one-to-one -one ratio. When I take that slide, put it down on the light table, and then take an actual penny and put it on top of my slide, the slide will have the penny at the exact same size as the physical penny. In other words, the object is rendered on the film, or in the case of digital photography, on the image sensor at an actual size. So let's assume that your image sensor is a little bit larger than a penny. If the photo of the penny on that image sensor matches the size of a physical penny, that's one to one. Well, that's sort of odd to try to figure out. Uh, you really would only be able to figure that out after the fact, generally speaking. And so I don't think too much about that sort of literal definition as it were, at least the generally accepted definition. But just think of close-up as getting fairly close to an object and macro as getting 
really close. So there is kind of a typically used technical definition of that one-to-one -one ratio or larger, where essentially you're getting in really close and getting a detail shot of a subject. You're really getting in to those close details. But whatever it is, macro versus close up, when you're getting really close to a subject, focusing from, dis from a distance of just maybe a few inches, you're gonna have fun. There's gonna be some really interesting explorations. And so here, you know, we have something that would be certainly considered macro as opposed to the previous image that was just a close-up, shall we say, because here this bug actually appears larger than in real life. And I don't mean just on the screen, but if we were to compare this, for example, if this had been captured with slide film and we put this little bug on top of the slide, the bug in the photo on that slide would actually be larger than the bug walking around on that slide. So when it comes to macro photography, I think one of the first tips, especially if you're just getting started or if you've had, you know, a little dabbling in macro and you've gotten a little bit frustrated, which is understandable. We'll talk about some of those issues. But first and foremost, I would say is start easy. And I already mentioned the example of just finding things around the house, you know, around your studio, whatever the case might be. Objects that you can just put under your lens and photograph. Indoors is a really good place to start with macro photography. And I'm not just saying that because we've gotten some unseasonably cold weather. It seems like winter has come a little bit early here in Tennessee. Not only is it more comfortable to be indoors, but also indoors, you've got a little bit more of a controlled environment. You probably have more lighting available to you, even if you don't have a special lighting setup and you certainly don't have any wind in your uh, house or in your studio environment. Outdoors, macro can be really frustrating. Macro photography, of flowers, for example, can be wildly frustrating out in the real world because if there's any breeze at all, those flowers will just bounce around. So start indoors with subjects that aren't going anywhere, with static objects that you can just comfortably place in front of your lens. Here are just some coffee beans, for example, and explore that macro photography. Start having fun with it. Make sure that you're leading with the fun. There certainly can be some challenges in macro photography. But focus on looking for subjects that will be relatively easy to photograph and fun to photograph and that might offer some interesting colors, textures, etc. But then we should talk about the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room when it comes to macro photography and that is depth of field. There's not going to be much depth of field. I remember being amused I was leading a field photography workshop out in the Olympic Peninsula, Washington State, and we were doing a little bit of close-up work on the beach with some pebbles and shells and whatnot. And one of the participants was expressing a little bit of frustration that they weren't getting enough depth of field. They had already stopped down to F8. Should they stop down further? And I had to sort of chuckle because my thought was, it doesn't matter what you stop down to, <laughs> you're not going to end up with very much depth of field. And the simple fact of the matter is, when you're focusing very close on a subject, no matter what else you're doing, you're going to end up with narrow depth of field. If you're focusing at a great distance, if you're focusing at a subject that's a mile away from you, you will have lots of depth of field. If you're focusing on a subject that's a couple of inches away from you, then you'll have very little depth of field. If it's a few feet, that's where you start to have more control over depth of field, where the lens aperture takes on a primary role in terms of photographic creativity. But when it comes to macro, you are going to have narrow depth of field. You can see in this example, we've got this flower and just this little strip of the petals here over on the left side that is in focus. And then the interior organs of the flower here, just a tiny narrow little swath that is in focus. Very, very narrow depth of field because I'm focusing closely. And that is something that I would say in general, we just have to come to terms with. We just have to accept and make lemonade out of lemons, essentially. With macro and close-up photography, you're going to have very narrow depth of field. So now can you use that essentially to your advantage? Can you make that narrow depth of field more interesting? Now, it also creates the challenge of needing to try to make sure that you put the depth of field in the best spot possible. And so here, where would that be? I don't know. <laughs> this is a subject that really could use more depth of field than we have in this current photo. But 
when you have narrow depth of field, which is going to be the case in macro photography, if you don't have too much choice, and I'll talk about some other options here momentarily, but when you don't really have much of a choice, it's where do you place that depth of field where it's most meaningful? Is it at the very interior of the flower? Is it on just the edge of the petals? Somewhere that is going to, number one, look good, be captivating, but also one of the ways I look at that is, in a way, position that depth of field so it doesn't look like a mistake. So it doesn't look like you put it in the wrong spot, which is not always the easiest answer to uh, to figure out, to come up with. And so just to give you a little bit of a sense here, many of you are aware I'm, I'm a fan of the PhotoPills app, which is available for both Android and iOS or iPhone smartphones. It's a very valuable tool in a wide variety of areas of photographic planning. And in the context of macro photography, it can be tremendously helpful or at least informative when it comes to calculating depth of field. So here, a fairly typical scenario. So this is with a digital SLR with a 100 millimeter macro lens, stopped way down to f22, trying to get lots of depth of field, but focusing six inches away. And I have to say, six inches is a pretty good distance to be focusing when it comes to macro photography. In many cases, I will get to the point where I'm accidentally bumping the lens element, the front lens element, into the subject that I'm trying to photograph because, well, I'm not paying close enough attention and I'm trying to get everything lined up just perfectly. So we're very often focusing incredibly close. Here, not something six inches that I would consider being extremely close in the context of macro photography, obviously pretty close. But take a look at the details here. If we look at the depth of field, we have one 32nd of an inch. One 32nd of an inch. That is very, very narrow depth of field. If you consider zooming in close on an insect that's one inch long, a moderate sized beetle, only one 32nd of its body is going to be in focus. So where are you going to put that? Probably on the eye, for example or some other interesting detail if that were the case. But the point is that we're gonna have very narrow depth of field with macro. I think just best to accept that and to try to make the most of it, to try to make that narrow depth of field just uh, more interesting, I would say. And obviously recognizing if we can get a little bit further away from our subject, if we can stop down the lens a little bit more, then we might be able to achieve a little bit more depth of field, but regardless, when we're focusing very close, it's going to be pretty minimal. And so using that depth of field to the best of your ability, putting it in the right spot. Another handy tip though, make sure that the depth of field is, shall we say, sitting at the right angle. You can take a look at this photo of the leaf and a nice close in detail. And you'll see that in the center of the frame here, we have sharp focus. But up at the top edge of the frame and down at the bottom edge of the frame, we do not have sharp focus anymore. Now this might seem odd because depth of field is a plane. It relates to distance from the, the lens or the image sensor. And so we would expect this leaf to be entirely in focus or at least the, the, the same level, the veins, the, the primary veins here, the larger veins, maybe they're sticking up far enough that they're out of that depth of field. Well, the issue here is that the leaf wasn't laying perfectly flat, essentially. And so think of, you know, the depth of field. If the leaf had been positioned perfectly orthogonal to the lens, so at a perfect right angle to the lens, then that narrow depth of field would have covered up the entirety of the, at least the, ba the main surface of the leaf. But if that leaf is sort of tilted a little bit, now we're taking that depth of field and essentially we're breaking that plane with, in this case, the leaf, so that the depth of field only aligns with the center. So when we're dealing with very, very narrow depth of field, and if we have an object that's relatively flat like this leaf, and we want the entirety of it to be in focus, we also need to make sure that the leaf is perfectly orthogonal to the lens, that it's not at a little bit of an angle, so that the entire surface of the leaf will be in focus versus having in focus versus out of focus here and out of focus there. And so being very careful with positioning that depth of field, which by the way, a little side tip is that with macro photography, the live view display on your camera can be tremendously helpful to get a much better look 
at the details, including being able to zoom in, not with the lens, but zoom in on the LCD display so that you can get a closer look, make sure that your focus is tack sharp, and make sure that your depth of field is positioned in exactly the right spot and that you're maximizing the use of that depth of field. And yes, Mark, <laughs> good to see you, by the way, Mark, and really good question, that a challenge with depth of field is hand handheld for sure. It's a particular challenge because when you're hand holding, even if you can get established, because focus really, when it comes to macro, don't think of focus so much as about turning the dial. Think about focus as shifting the camera closer to or further away the subject. And so it, when you think of it in that way, hand holding, it's very easy if you're just, you know, kind of rocking ever so slightly that you've got everything perfect, but as you go to press the shutter release, you're shifting ever so slightly closer to or further away from the subject. And there's some, some gadgets, needless to say, that I'll share that will make that a whole lot easier. But real good point, Mark. Uh, many times I've acknowledged that I often shoot handheld. I often do not use a tripod. Macro is one of those situations where suddenly that becomes a liability <laughs> rather than giving me more creative advantage. Now, when depth of field proves to be a little bit of a frustration for you where you really feel that you need more depth of field, there is a solution and that would be focus stacking. Some cameras, by the way, check out your camera to see if it features this option. Some cameras have a focus stacking feature that is automatic where it'll capture a bracketed set of images for focus stacking, but you can also do this manually. Uh, here's an example of a, a scene that I photographed. Here are just the thumbnails. I'll show you some larger versions of these images in just a moment. But you might be able to tell from the thumbnails that the very first frame here at the top left only the very front of the frame is in focus. And then the very narrow depth of field is shifting back and back and back and back. And so I'm capturing in this case a series of images starting with, for example, the depth of field all the way at the front of the frame and then moving it back a little bit and back a little bit and back a little bit, making sure that I'm overlapping that complete depth of field with each shift of the focus so that I have ultimately photos that cover the full range of depth of field for the scene that I'm photographing. And so just to illustrate that concept, here's a little, a little more clearly anyway, give you a little closer look. Here's the first shot and you can see that the depth of field, it's very narrow, but it's at the very front of the frame. And the next shot, that depth of field would have been shifted back just a little bit. And then another shot where it's shifted back just a little bit and so on and so on. So that we have a little swath of in focus for every little section of the photo this being the last photo in the sequence and you can see that that narrow depth of field is way at the back of the frame and so i very carefully captured a series of images where the depth of field is being shifted frame by frame then i can use software and photoshop has a feature that will do this in my experience the results are fairly mixed it doesn't do a great job the software that i use for focus stacking is called helicon focus it can take the series of images, so here the first image, there the last image, of course, a series of images in between. And with software such as Helicon Focus, which to me is the best tool for the job, you can create an image where you have blended all of those individual exposures into a final result where we have full depth of field all the way from the front of the frame to the back of the frame. Now here again, it works very nicely if you are fortunate enough to be photographing a subject that's not going to move. If you're photographing a living insect, for example, or a flower that might be moving around a little bit in the breeze, suddenly focus stacking can be a lot more challenging. But the point is that if the situation warrants it, focus stacking can help you work around that frustration of narrow depth of field. But honestly, my thinking when it comes to macro photography in general, I generally just prefer to embrace the fact that we're going to be working with narrow depth of field and try to find a way to make sure that that narrow depth of field is going to make the photo more interesting, that it's going to add an element of mystery or make the photo more captivating or just more visually interesting and try to make the most of the narrow depth of field that macro provides to us. But again, focus stacking is an option if you have a situation where you feel that you really need to try to make sure that you're getting as much depth of field as possible.
All right, so let's talk about some of the gear that can help make your photography, macro photography or close-up photography a, a bit easier. And we're gonna start off with getting started on the cheap, essentially. And so a couple of accessories that you might take a look at. If you say to yourself, you know, I don't have a macro lens, so how can I get into macro photography? Very easily, as it turns out. And so one thing that you might take a look at, this is uh, one of the least expensive ways that you can get into macro photography or close-up photography, is to get an extension tube. An extension tube, and I'll show you a little video clip here, it literally extends a tube between your camera and the lens. And so instead of, the, of mounting the lens on the camera, you would mount the lens onto an extension tube, and the extension tube would then mount onto the camera. And so you're just positioning the lens further away from the image sensor. And what that does is bring the focusing point essentially further forward, which means you can now focus much more closely at your subject. And so it takes a normal lens. This is a 24 to 105 millimeter lens, for example, that I'm using here. And it makes it a macro lens. This lens can all already focus reasonably closely, but with the addition of an extension tube, now you have a true close-up and, and borderline macro capability. So very, very close-up capabilities in terms of that focus. And that's one of the key things that makes a macro lens a macro lens is that it's able to focus very closely. As an aside, macro lenses tend to be among the sharpest lenses out there, and they're not just limited to macro. If you have a 100 millimeter macro lens, it's a 100 millimeter lens. You can use it for any other purpose that you might use a 100 millimeter lens in that particular example, and it'll give you sharper images than many other typical lenses of the same focal length. Another option is a close-up kit lens. And so this is a, a close-up adapter that will mount to the front of an existing lens. I sort of think of it as a magnifying glass that we can stick on the front of the lens. A little more sophisticated than that, obviously. But I'll share with you at the end of the session today a link. So Nissi is the item here that I'm demonstrating. And so you can see putting this on, screwing this on just like a filter onto the front of the lens. This particular kit does come with some step rings so that you can adapt it to a different size. If I remember correctly, out of the box it's 77 millimeter and there's adapters for a couple of other sizes, but you can get a discount on this close-up lens with the link that I'll share at the end of the presentation today. And so with either of those types of options, I just wanted to give you an illustration of that. And so using this close-up lens on that 24 to 105 millimeter lens, I captured a couple of little video clips to give you a sense. So this is without the adapter. As you can see, I mentioned the lens that I was using here is still capable of focusing relatively closely. No, it's not your eyes. That's not in focus at the moment, but I'm gonna play a video here as I shift the elephant here, fore and aft, little carved elephant, and you can see that there I have essentially a full head shot at the point where I get into sharp focus, and that's without the adapter. So this is the capability of that particular lens uh, right out of the box, as it were, out of the camera bag, still able to focus reasonably closely, but when I add that close-up adapter, then we get this significantly closer look. So it takes in this case, a lens that's able to focus relatively closely and gets it much closer to an actual macro capability. And so both of those, an extension tube or a close-up adapter for an existing lens, give you the ability to explore a little bit in the way of macro photography without an investment, without even having to buy a lens. Just use existing lenses that you have and adapt them so that they're able to focus more closely. And that'll give you at least the opportunity to play around a little bit with macro photography to see if it appeals to you. My guess is that it will, because it really can be a tremendous amount of fun. But of course, you also have the ability to get a macro lens. You don't have to just adapt your existing lenses. You can explore some macro lenses. And I actually was introduced, Noah was kind enough to introduce me to a couple of lenses that are able to give you some great possibilities 
really good quality lenses for a, a good, what I would call sort of an entry level price in terms of macro. And so a couple of those, uh, Leowa 60 millimeter macro lens. This is sort of a more traditional lens. It sells for around about a $400 price point. You can get a discount as someone who's joined me for this presentation from Hunt's Photo and Video, thanks to their sponsorship. So stay tuned to the end if you're interested in any of their lenses, you can get a discount on, and I'll share those details at the end of the session today. But this happens to be their 60, mil 60 millimeter macro. It's a pretty straightforward 60 millimeter macro lens, nice and sharp. It is a manual lens. And so I was sort of amused uh, at first when I, it was told to me that the lens was fully manual. And so you'll see here, first off, we have a dial for the lens aperture, so we don't adjust that on the camera. We essentially physically manually adjust the lens aperture as well as the focus. Now, I suppose the lens aperture, being able to set it via the camera is a little bit more convenient, but I sort of chuckled when I was told by the lens rep that this was manual focusing lens because my reaction was, who cares? <laughs> because when it comes to macro, I don't recommend using automatic focus to begin with because the odds of getting that autofocus exactly where you want it, getting that narrow depth of field positioned perfectly with autofocus, even if you move your focus point around, that can be a bit of a challenge. I strongly recommend manual focus when it comes to macro photography. And when you're manually focusing, of course, if the lens lacks autofocus, that's no problem at all. And so it was actually kind of fun exploring, you know, going a little old school, going back to my early days of having a completely manual camera setup where I had to adjust everything by hand. And so in this case, not a liability at all. In fact, really uh, an advantage because it wasn't going to lull me into thinking, well, I'll just let the camera do the autofocus. It's not there. And with macro, I don't want it there because you're not likely going to get the best results using autofocus in macro photography. And again, using the live view, zooming in on the live view display on your camera's LCD can really help you to get that focus spot on. And so just to give you some sense with this lens, and so a little bit of a video clip shot right through that macro lens. So this is a video shot on an SLR through that macro lens, 60 millimeter macro lens, and you'll see the focus shifting. So this in case you hadn't caught it on, caught on just quite yet, this is a, a close-up of a cactus. And so being able to go from zooming on the tips of the needles all the way in to the, the surface, as it were, of the cactus in order to capture some really interesting colors and textures with that macro lens. So a really fun lens to work with. I've enjoyed playing with it for the, the last uh, couple of weeks. Just looking for random, I mentioned the weather's not been so great, so I've mostly taken shelter indoors and looked for things around the house that I could take a closer look at and had great fun shooting with this lens. It worked out very, very nicely. But I have to say, there was another lens that I enjoyed even more, that I found even more fun, and that is a 15 millimeter macro lens. And I was using this on a crop sensor, so my effective focal length was a little bit longer, my field of view is a little bit narrower, but you could use this on a full frame sensor as well. And this, it's really kind of a very cool concept, if you will, in macro photography and one that isn't very common. Wide angle photography, we typically think of, I think most photographers think of as landscape photography, where we have lots of depth of field and we're seeing a grand landscape. But with macro, there's a really interesting and I think fun concept because now we're focusing very closely on a subject, but we still have a relatively wide field of view. And so we can get a little bit more context around the subject that we're photographing. And so, and this lens has a couple of interesting features. So again, we can use it on a crop sensor or full frame. One of the features we'll need a crop sensor for, but 15 millimeters, obviously with full frame, and then depending on the crop factor for your sensor, that would be effectively a little bit longer. Once again, manual, so we're manually adjusting the lens aperture as well as the focus point, uh, more on focusing uh, in, a, in a moment because there's other tricks that I would recommend when it comes to focusing beyond the lens itself. But this was a great fun lens to shoot with and I look forward to exploring it more. In fact, I wanna explore this lens in the springtime 
when the flowers start blooming and I can get out in the world with some decent weather and find some nice floral scenes, landscape scenes, where I can get really, really close but still have some context of what's around. But in the meantime, I found a little festive scene here and use this just as a platform to demonstrate the concept here that I can focus on something really close and yet have this wider field of view so that I have a little bit more context. So once again, when it comes to uh, you know a video shot right through this macro lens, and you can see that I'm able to zoom in really, really, well, zoom, focus in really, really close on that subject that's literally right in front of the lens, almost touching the lens, but then still have a degree of that overall, you know, sort of ambiance, the context of that particular subject. And so here, a tree obviously with some lights in the background. And so having that foreground element in sharp focus, and then the lights and the, the rest of the tree in the background providing some degree of context. So, and, and this was just me playing around with this lens. I really can't wait to get out and explore using this lens more seriously because it opens up such what I think is a really interesting possibility in terms of macro shots with that wider field of view. So you're taking in a little bit more of the scene around you. And this particular lens also has a shift capability. Now to make use of the shift capability, you need to be using the lens on a cropped sensor, not a full frame sensor, because that will enable you the extra space as it were in the image circle. And so I wanna show you that shift in action. So here's a side view of the lens mounted on a camera and being able to just push in the release button and slide the lens Think of this as moving the lens relative to the image sensor position. And so you're projecting an image circle, but then shifting that circle, the image that you're projecting. And again, with the circle, the image circle being larger than the image sensor, thanks to the cropped sensor, now you're able to move that image circle around without losing any of the actual image. And so just to give you a sense of that in action here, a video once again shot through that 15 millimeter macro lens while shifting the lens up and down in order to shift. So you can obviously correct for some perspective issues or just fine tune the composition in the context of macro photography uh, when it comes to that. Uh, see, Bob, uh, Bob Bass, good to see you here joining us for the presentation today. And uh, which method he's asking do you prefer, moving the camera or adjusting manual focus? And I, as I sort of alluded to briefly there, I definitely prefer to move the camera. So that was well, admittedly, you asked the question a couple minutes ago and I just got to it, <laughs> but it sets up perfectly the next topic that I want to address, and that is using a focusing rail. Because as I mentioned, focusing with the lens to me is, well, autofocus first off, I don't have any need for, in my opinion, in macro photography. I mean, I suppose, in fairness, getting me a little bit closer to an initial starting point and then fine tuning but I don't find that typically is, is very much help in the context of macro photography. And I mentioned even, you know, adjusting the focus on the lens itself isn't even all that critical, not that it doesn't matter at all, but especially when it comes to fine tuning the focus, I recommend moving the camera, moving the overall assembly. And one of the easiest ways to go about that is to use a focusing rail. So this is a focusing rail that you can get a special offer on. It actually starts off very reasonably at $130, and I was quite impressed at just how smooth the movement of this focusing rail really is. It gives you great fine control. The idea, you can see here, I have a camera mounted on the focusing rail. One of the cool things about this particular focusing rail, you can see it has little feet. It can stand all on its own. Yes, of course, you can mount this focusing rail onto a ball head, for example, so that you can mount this onto a tripod, but it also works very nicely for tabletop photography. And so you've got these the little padded legs, so you get a nice stable platform even just on a tabletop on a surface. But yes, of course, you could use a tripod with this as well. And then to give you a sense, a few videos here that gives you a sense here, I can just rotate, so I'm turning that main screw and the camera, therefore, is moving closer to the subject or further away from the subject just by turning that screw. And so this gives you the ability, obviously you can kind of turn quickly to get to the point that you want. You could adjust the focus on the lens to get you to a pretty good starting point and then slowly just fine tune the rotation of that screw to get that camera into perfect position. So again, using 
the camera's live view display on the LCD, probably zooming in on that display on the LCD so that you can get a closer look at the area that you want to make sure is in sharp focus, and then using that focusing rail to just rotate the screw. And here, just a close-up showing the lens moving up, but that's the most exciting shot. But just to give you a sense that what we're really doing is moving that whole camera lens assembly closer to or further away from the subject so that we can get that depth of field into exactly the right spot, get our focus into exactly the spot where we need it for that subject. Now, taking that a step further, I mentioned tripod. You know, I, I have acknowledged more than once that I tend not to use a tripod, but when it comes to macro photography, a good camera support really is invaluable. And so focusing rail is a great way to start even just tabletop photography with a focusing rail, but also a tripod. And Noah at Hunt's Photo and Video introduced me to this really nice tripod that uh, it's from Vanguard. It has this column essentially. So think of a center column, but it's mounted kind of on the outside as it were, and it extends, it telescopes out. And so we can get the camera into all sorts of great positions and the legs go out nearly flat. So as you can see here, I'm able to get the camera out there hovering over a subject. So if I've got a little flower in the field that I wanted to focus on, I can get that tripod set out very, very low to the ground and then even use that column to adjust the overall position. It rotates and slides out, it, all sorts of adjustments possible with this really, really great tripod. And it's less than $200, by the way, and you can get a special discount as part of the Hunt sponsorship of today's presentation. So really nice tripod. And just to give you a sense here, a little wider view as I pan a video around, the tripod set down very low, fully adjustable column there that can maneuver into all sorts of great positions. So that, you know, for a wide variety of purposes in photography, you could have two cameras mounted on either end of this post, for example, so that you've got two different lenses aimed at the same subject at the same time, two different cameras and lenses. But for macro photography, just a wonderfully helpful tool as far as being able to get really close into a subject. And one of the bigger challenges tends to be those subjects that are down low, getting a tripod. Many tripods don't enable you to get especially low down to your subject. And, oh, the focusing rail, just a backup, just a moment here. That's that Nissi brand, same as the close-up lens adapter. And I will share a link at the end of today's presentation that'll take you to a list of all those products as well, including discounts, so you can take advantage of those. And I saw Sam's question here about lighting, and yes, I'll have a cool, and there's many lighting options, but I'll talk about those a little bit later. But first, yet another, I think, super cool accessory. One that's been around for a while, although a variation that I was just introduced to by Noah at Hunt's Photo. And that is, well, the first one is the plamp, which is a clamp that is mostly intended for clamping a plant, and therefore plamp. And so first off, it has one end that attaches to a surface. It could be a ledge here, tabletop, for example. More often out in the field, I'm attaching plamps to my tripod legs. And so here we see in action, I believe we will see in action. I thought we were going to see, here it goes, in action. <laughs> the video didn't want to play. But the plamp, the mounting bracket, clamping onto a surface. So again, this could be a tripod leg or a, a fence post or a tree branch or a tabletop, whatever the case might be. So you can get a nice solid attachment point. And then at the other end, we have a little clip. And this has actually a screw set so that now instead of just squeezing to open it up and then releasing where we've got this fixed pressure, you can actually turn a screw to adjust the tightness. And what you probably, you can't really tell with this shot, but in the middle of that clamp, there's a couple of foam pads so that if, for example, you're wrapping it around the stem of a flower, it's not going to damage the stem. It's just going to hold it in that foam very nicely. And so here playing a quick video and you can see turning the screw. So opening up that clamp and then closing it down. And here we'll put a little wicker basket comfortably with that padding so it's not being damaged at all and being held firm by the clamp. 
And so I use this for all sorts of things. Obviously, as it was originally intended to hold plants. So to take a flower and position it right in front of the lens just by maneuvering the plant clamp, as I'll show you here in just a moment. Here to photograph a basket, for example, to hold a reflector. We'll talk about reflectors and diffusers a little bit later. To hold basically anything you might need <laughs> to be held can work out very nicely, but especially to hold objects that in the context of macro photography that you want to position right in front of your lens. And the arm of the plant has this totally you know, segmented, flexible arm. And so just to give you a sense of that, we can put that into just any position at all just by tweaking it to and from to get the item that we're going to photograph into just the right position in front of the lens. So it works out very, very nicely in this case to hold that little basket steady so I could then adjust my focus and capture images of the, the detail in this particular case. So again, that plant can be, I think, tremendously helpful as far as holding anything in the context of your photography, but really for macro photography, I would have several of these, you know, one holding a flower, one holding a diffuser or a reflector, uh, possibly holding a light, you know, whatever the case might be, anything that you need to hold in a particular position that you want to be able to move around into any position you need. The plant is absolutely wonderful for that purpose. I'd recommend having at least a couple or a few of them in your bag when you're going to be setting out and doing some macro photography. But the new variation on this that I did not know about, Noah let me know about this, a uh, really clever variation, that would be the ground plant. And so you can see basically the exact same thing as the plant that I just showed you, except at the other end, we don't have that clamp that would be attached to a tripod leg or to a tabletop or what have you. So what do we have down there? It, it's a clever, a little hidden trick here, I guess you might say. So watch the video here and you'll see that at that base that I'm holding is hidden a screwdriver, which I can reverse and then put that screwdriver right into the ground so that I have a stable platform in the ground. I don't have to clamp onto a tripod or a branch or a, a fence post. I can just stick that screwdriver right into the ground and it will hold the, well in this case, the ground clamp firmly in the ground so that I can then of course fine tune the clamp and clamp an object just as I showed you with the, the regular clamp. So a really cool variation on the plant that you might consider if you're doing a fair amount of photography outdoors, especially low to the ground, using a tripod way down low where you want to be able to hold objects also close down to the ground with the camera. So Sam asked about lighting. First off, a couple simple things. One would be the ability to use a flash, of course, and there's all sorts of different flash possibilities. Ring lights that will mount at the end of a flash, or sorry, at the end of a macro lens. In some cases, you can get a twin light where we've got a couple of flashes that can be maneuvered around and their angles adjusted. And so certainly there's a variety of flash that is available for macro photography that would typically take the form of a ring light would be the most classic example where we're getting the light right onto the subject. We don't want to use the normal flash on the camera because when the subject is so close to the lens, you're going to cast the shadow of the lens onto the subject if you're using your traditional light for macro, your traditional flash, I should say, for macro photography in many cases. And so a couple of accessories that I find to be very helpful, uh, a reflector, and I would say reflector slash diffuser. And so this is a great little reflector that is good for macro photography, small size. And actually this normally is, I believe, $16. You can get this as part of the show special for today's presentation for just $10. And there's also a silver and gold option available. So this is the white option. And so play a little video so you can see, obviously just reflecting. So the idea is that I'm bouncing light from some other source, could be sunlight, could be some other light source, and then reflecting it into position onto the subject. And so just to give you a sense with the subject, if we've got not enough light on you know one side of the subject, I can use that reflector to bounce some of that light into the right area of the subject. And so this can take all sorts of forms. I mentioned the gold silver version. So you've got warmer light uh, with the gold version, for example, a little bit softer light with a white reflector, but being able to bounce some of that light 
to get, get it to fill in. Think of it, you know, variation on a fill flash, getting that into just the right position. Also an object, once you get it in the right spot, that can be helpful to hold in position with a clamp. And also, in some respects, I would say maybe even the more useful purpose is, uh, granted, in macro photography, oftentimes we're kind of short on light and we need to add more light. But often I find that with macro, contrast is a bigger problem. And so I want to soften up that light. And so the same reflector disc, in this case, that translucent reflector disc, can be used as a diffuser so that you can soften up the light. So that we've got a softer light, we don't have the strong highlights and shadows, we don't have the, the glare and reflections, and that can in many cases be even more valuable in macro photography, including if you're using a flash, sh putting a flash, as long as it's not a ring light <laughs> mounted at the end of the lens, but if you have some flashes positioned over to the side of the subject, you could then use that reflector slash diffuser in order to soften up that flashlight on the subject. And uh, yes, Mark, perfectly timed, you, comes up with a, a great suggestion, which, uh, funny enough, I had not heard about until Noah sent me one of these to play with from Hunt's Photo and Video, and it is amazing. I absolutely love this little device. Uh, so, Mark, you're absolutely right. The LumaCube, in this case, the RGB Panel Go, they've got a variety of different devices that are available, lighting devices, and they are fantastic. This particular model, so this is the RGB panel Go. It's a light, and I'll show you from the other side as well so you get a better sense of what's going on. But it is a, a light, an LED illumination source, a number of LEDs, and it has a rechargeable battery. You can mount it on the hot shoe with the flash. Typically with macro, of course, I would be mounting it somewhere else, uh, using that same setup to just mount it on a tabletop or holding it in place as the case may be. But it's got a battery inside, so it's LED lights, rechargeable battery. I can plug it in and power it from the wall outlet, for example, if need be, but so much more convenient to just charge it up and then take it out there and then adjust it. So first off, this little video, is, I'm going to cycle you through some of the adjustments. We'll start off with the level adjustment. I can adjust the intensity, the strength of the light, how bright that light is. I can also adjust the color temperature, so cool it down a little bit or warm it up a little bit, so make a little bit more of a yellowish light as opposed to a white light, for example. And then notice the RGB in the name. We can also adjust the color of the light. So let's take a look at that in action. I'll play the video here. So first off, adjusting the level or the brightness, and you can see the light getting more dim and then getting brighter and brighter. And again, I'll show you this at a different angle in a moment. The temperature, so just shifting to a warmer, more of a yellowish light versus a cooler light, more neutral light, and then the color. We can create illumination of any color of the rainbow with the ability, of course, to still adjust the overall brightness level as well. So just, in this case, spinning through the range of different color possibilities in order to adjust the appearance of that light. And so then to show you that from another angle, just in terms of the color, because I think this is uh, kind of fun, kind of a cool little setup. And so just cycling through. I know it looks out of focus. That's just because there's a diffuser panel on the front of it, so the lighting itself is made to look like it's soft, but uh, it really was in focus, I promise you. And again, cycling through the various range of colors. And this is set at full brightness, which is why exposing for the illumination itself, the background of course drops off to pure black, even though I was in a bright room when I captured this video. And so the ability to adjust the color as well as the intensity of the light. And again, battery powered, rechargeable battery. You can hand hold this and just position it exactly where you want it. A fantastic accessory. A fun accessory for all sorts of possibilities, but when it comes to macro photography, I think incredibly helpful. So just to illustrate the concept a little bit here, shifting through the different colors for the light with just a kind of a, a basic setup here and really giving you that ability to add an accent color. You could use multiple of these to have a couple of white light sources, for example, with a little bit of an accent color from one particular angle. And, you know, one other video here showing you uh, just, you know, a little bit of fun with what you can do in terms of illuminating that subject with 
the light source, which can be, of course, a colored light source, at least I think. That video will play, maybe. I don't know why that one, Let's see if it'll play now. There we go. So now shifting through those different colors, again, just to illustrate that concept, but it can be a lot of fun to add some, you know, potentially multiple colored lights coming from different angles and creating all sorts of cool and abstract and interesting effects. But that is a light source that I have found to be tremendously helpful and fun when it comes to macro photography. And with that, I want to thank you very much for joining me today. I know Renee's been in the background checking to see if there's any questions among the chat. And so if any of you have any additional questions, I'd be happy to address those. In the meantime, as promised, I do want to, well, once again, thank Hunt's Photo and Video. Thanks to Gary Farber at Hunt's as well as Noah Buchanan. They've been tremendously helpful, and especially in the context of finding some cool, clever gadgets for me to share with you. And the items that I have shared with you are available with special discounts. So if you point your web browser to timgray.me slash hunts, that will redirect you to a page on my Gray Learning website that will have a list of the various items that I shared with you, the, the gear that I shared with you today, including details about discounts that are available for those. I believe, for example, with the Leowa lenses, it was 10% off any of their lenses but a variety of really good discounts that you could take advantage of if you're interested in exploring some of these tools in macro photography for yourself. And if there's something else that wasn't on the list that you're interested in, on that same page is Noah Buchanan's email address at Hunt's Photo so that you can contact him directly and get a quote on any items that you might be looking for, whether it's macro photography or anything else. He's very helpful uh, and especially very knowledgeable, knowledgeable when it comes to mirrorless cameras. So if you're trying to decide which direction to go on mirrorless, He's a great resource to reach out to and to get some tips. And then once again, I will have in January as well as February a couple of online workshops. If you're interested in learning from me to make the most of Lightroom Classic in your workflow, I've got one on cleaning up your mess in Lightroom Classic, getting order restored to your catalog, and as well, optimizing your photos in Lightroom Classic. And so you can find out about both of those online workshops, all the details, and how you'll be able to get answers to all of your questions if you participate in the online workshop. Just point your web browser to graylearning.com and you'll find both of those listed right on the homepage. All right. In the meantime, I want to thank you very, very much for joining me once again. I hope you found that helpful and informative and maybe a little bit inspiring, maybe getting you a little closer to exploring the world of close-up and macro photography. And so thanks again for joining me and I'll hope to see you soon again for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning Live webinar series. In the meantime, happy holidays everyone. Thanks very much.